On This Week in Enterprise Tech, it's midnight. Do you know where your submarine fiber is? Google hands out the patent troll smackdown, and we talk all about conferences, conferences, conferences. Quiet on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 35, recorded April 1st, 2013. Patton Troll Smackdown. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Interop Las Vegas, the largest independent technology conference and expo for IT professionals. If you're in IT, you can't miss this year's event. Visit www.interop.com to register and use code WELV for $200 off a conference pass or a free expo pass. And by Directory Wizards. If you have a need for directory synchronization, Directory Wizards has the solution. Unity Sync. Offer a truly unified global address list, create a messaging forest, link seamlessly with HR databases, or build a backup forest to aid in disaster recovery. Visit derwiz.com slash enterprise for an extended evaluation that you can download, configure, and put into action today. And by Rackspace, the open cloud company. At Rackspace, build what you want, where you want, and how you want it, all backed by their world-renowned fanatical support. Try it today. Download the open cloud at rackspace.com slash open. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how it's all connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballas here. I'm the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. And as always, I am accompanied by a fantastic panel, starting with Mr. Brian Chi, the evangelist for Thin Links. Brian, coming to us from Honolulu, how is the geek in paradise? Uh, aside from muted. Ah. Or I had the microphone, I had the Yeti muted instead of Skype. Sorry. No, last night I was up late tinkering with Raspberry Pis, thinking about creating a Wi Fi based public address system so that we can do concerts without throwing cables all over the place. Actually, again, I, I, that's one of those topics that I think home theater geeks would love to get their hands on because. Uh, but PAs are notorious for being difficult and kind of touchy in large, large spaces. But we'll come back to that later. I, I do want to move on to our on-location panelist, Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, where in the world are you? Padre, I am live at the Rosenshingle Creek Resort in Orlando, Florida, uh, where bright and early in the morning, the SNW 2013 conference will kick off. Now, this is a conference dedicated to storage, networking, business intelligence, big data, and all things having to do with bits in extremely large large quantities. Uh, I apologize to all our listeners if there's noise around me, but hey, the conference is a building, the crowds are gathering, and he, here I am in the middle of it. You know, it's all part of the live experience. And, uh, you know, we came from Enterprise Connect just two weeks ago, so I think people should be used to it. Now, let's get straight into it. We've got our first Enterprise Byte, and that is, well, courtesy of Google. Now, the Google Glass Explorer program, if you hadn't heard about it, was a, a little competition for the honor of plunking down $1,500 to buy an early edition of Google Glass. Google said they were going to have about 8,000 of these, and uh, the, the whole contest revolved around posting on either Twitter or Google+, the hashtag, if I had glass, and then what you would do with it. Well, the uh, returns are in, and the people who have won the contest are starting to get their invitations. Now, uh, Jason's got a picture of what a Google Glass Explorer application actually looked like. It was really nothing more than just, uh, well, you posting on your status update, if I had glass, I would do this. In this case, I, I actually posted... If I had glass, I would give the audience at Twit, which is notorious for being at the very cutting edge of media, a view of what it looks like to host a show at the Brick House from the perspective of the host. 
Well, Google went for it, and they gave me this, which was an invitation, if Jason will bring up the second picture, that uh, basically said, you are welcome to Google Glass. You see at the bottom there, uh, the uh, from Project Glass, and actually the third picture is a zoomed in, so if Jason moves to that, he'll be able to actually see what the text looks like. This is pretty much what it looked like for everyone who received a uh, an invitation to be in the program. Thanks for applying. We'd like to invite you to our Glass Explorers program. We'll be sending you a private message with more details in the coming weeks. Now, they haven't actually sent those coming messages, not yet. It's, uh, it's still an ongoing process. In fact, they are still informing the winners of the contest, but one would hope that uh, within a week or so, we'll get the details as to how we pay for our purchase, for our prize, and when we will actually receive it. Now, Chibert, I want to throw this over to you first because, uh, well, actually, no, you know what? I'm going to throw it over to you, Curtis, because you're over there in Orlando, and uh, we just actually had a, a talk about Google Glass what do you see Google Glass being useful for in a setting like, let's say, a conference? Well, to me, Google Glass would be exciting at a conference because it would give you the opportunity to do a couple of things. One of those is to get additional material up on Google Glass. The other is really to expand that whole notion of sharing the experience with the people both around you and those who couldn't make it to the physical venue. You know, Conference organizers are starting to really understand that there's an entire audience out there who would love to be part of the conference experience but can't be on site. And I think Google Glass has the real opportunity to expand that in ways we haven't even thought about yet. So for me, Google Glass and physical conference is a match made well, if not in heaven, at least in a pretty good place. Yeah. Chibert, uh, let me throw over to you because I saw a mock-up of an application for Google Glass I thought was probably the coolest thing ever from an IT perspective. And that was the ability to wear Google Glass and it used the camera to identify pieces of equipment within a rack. So as you were looking at the rack, there would be a, a little indication of this is what it is and do you want me to give you more information? So for example, I could look at a switch and say, go, uh, Go Glass, and it would tell me, okay, this is how you reset the switch. This is how you interface with the switch. Those kinds of niche applications seem to me what's going to drive the adoption of a product like Glass, maybe not Glass itself, in the enterprise. Well, what are your thoughts? Well, I've I've actually had proposals into the National Science Foundation for oh no, a couple of decades now. A uh, botanist and I have had this idea that we wanted to do augmented reality using GPS and HUD displays so that when we're out doing field ecology, say in a national park or some sort of conservation area, it can help with displaying images so we can identify rare species, perhaps um, even do things like looking at a, um, a wash in a desert and actually display over that things like rainfall or wind or all kinds of other data. The, Problem has been that the toolkits from some of the other HUD display systems have either been really, really expensive or just unavailable. Um, so the science community has been itching to get their hands onto something a lot more flexible and having something that integrates nicely with, say, the Android platform, uh -huh, um, could get interesting. And I, I can foresee a lot of really good science being done with the Google Glass. All right. Now, I, I do want to bring up sort of the, the elephant in the room, and that is there's a lot of tech journalists who are bringing up the point that Glass sounds a little bit about like the Nexus Q. If you remember from last year's Google, Google I.O., it was that little micro ball-shaped thing. We're not really sure what it was. It was a media device, a miniature computer, whatever. It was an interesting idea, but the problem with the Nexus Q was nobody really knew what to do with it. Google released this thing hoping that people would develop for it, that they would find the use case to have a Nexus Q. But it ended up being too expensive because it was assembled in the United States. It ended up not getting a lot of adoption. I've actually got two of them. I can make them talk to each other. It's kind of cool, but aside from a project that I, I break out every other weekend, it doesn't have a whole lot of practical application. We're seeing the same thing with Google Glass. Google has announced that it will be manufactured by Foxconn, but it will be assembled in the United States. So the components will come forever, wherever they come, and then they're, they are put together here in the United States, just like the queue. My question to you, Curtis, is, 
Does this kind of make Google Glass just another experiment like the Nexus? Or do you think Google is actually going to throw their weight behind this? Uh, I guess the, the, another way of asking this is, can we expect in six months after the release of Google Glass to hear Google's pulling the plug like they did with the Q? I'm not sure they'll pull the plug that quickly, but for a couple of reasons. One is that in terms of use cases, we've already got a, a longer ramp with Google Glass than we've had uh, with something like Nexus because we all know that heads-up displays already exist. We've, we've seen how those were in operation, and I think a lot of people will at least begin their experimentation with Google Glass from a point of view of making something for a smaller, perhaps more ubiquitous heads-up display. That gives them a nice basis to build on, and then when that basis gets built upon, we'll start to see the real innovation. Now, that doesn't mean that Google Glass in its initial configuration is going to be the product that takes over the world. But I think it does give it a, a longer or larger window in which to try to find some success. So I think that I feel a little bit better about Google Glass just because so many people are already talking about how it can be used in real world applications. That alone has to make the executives as Google feel a little bit better about this one. I actually like that point. The fact that people are able to bring up real world examples of how they would use Glass, of, of applications they'd like to see develop, tells me that maybe there, there, there's a bit more leg underneath this project than with the Q. But over to you, Chiebert. $1,500 is a freak ton. I'm sorry, that's a technical term. Yes, a freak ton of money for something that we haven't really seen in the wild. Now, of course, you're, you're willing to pay that. I'm willing to pay that. In fact, you've, you've asked if you could have the developer version of the glasses that I'm going to get. $1,500 is a starting point. Where do you think it needs to get in order to be more than just a science project? Well, the uh, price really needs to drop, oh geez, 50, 60, maybe even 70% for it to really, really start becoming the accessory for your Android phone that everybody wants to have. Um, I do agree with HiWeb. Sub 500 is probably going to be a pretty good number. Uh, Beatmaster under 300 bucks, I'm not sure that's realistic. Um, we're talking about some very, very sexy miniaturization. Keep in mind that the military versions of these Google Glasses, which have been in production for quite a while, start at 10 grand a pop. <laughs> um, the difference, though, is they have a whole lot of other electronics in them. Um, they actually have some night vision capability, and they also have GPS capability and a lot of um, accelerometer capability in them. So you're buying a lot more than what Google Glass is supposed to be. Uh, but having said that, the Google Glass has a lot of potential. Um, I think it has at least as much potential as the so-called smart watches that everybody are going crazy with, AKA the, peb the Pebble. Um, I certainly have a reservation in for a smart watch. And I can't wait to get my hands on a Google Glass for the exact same reason. I would like to extend the platform. I would like to bring augmented reality as a much cleaner way of doing things than holding my cell phone up in front of my face, walking down the street and slamming my head into a telephone pole. Well, I think the next time we're going to be talking about glass is when I actually get a, a pair. And let me make you this promise. You. Yeah, that's right. You in the Twilight Riot. We've got several pairs of glasses coming to the brick house. Uh, we're going to give you a, a day of view of exactly what this product can do. And uh, don't be surprised if we give you some interesting content from the brick house. Uh, for now, let's move on to the next Enterprise Byte. And that is an interesting little story about the Internet backbone being cut. Now, we always hear about attacks on the infrastructure, be it hack attacks or people going after SCADA devices. This is sort of old school. This is submarine cables being cut. Now, for those who, who don't know, the way that we connect the various continents is not via satellite. I mean, you can do that, but it's typically slow, it's expensive, there's high latency. We've actually got submarine cable. It's not really cable. We've got submarine fiber that runs along the, uh, the bottom of the ocean and hooks up different points between the continents and allows us to have high-speed communications, be it telephone or Internet, uh, to all the various parts of the world. Chebert, 
Tell me a little bit about what it takes to run cable from one side of the world to another. But running submarine cable actually comes into two basic categories. There's the shallow water stuff that you can run off a barge. In fact, a lot of those um, systems actually have a long plow that's based on a you know arm, and it actually just uses air jets to dig a trench in the bottom of a bay or something and um, lay the cable. What you're seeing on the screen now is an example of a medium to deep water sled um, where it actually has, is dragged behind a special cable laying switch a ship, which, oh, by the way, has a really, really sexy hold in it. Um, the whole concept is, is the cable is wound in the ship's hold in a very, very special way so that it pays out at a constant rate. And what you're seeing going along the screen is actually one of those repeaters. Um, when I do long, long range testing, I actually have 100 kilometers of fiber optic cable that I actually have in the lab because it's about 100 kilometers between repeaters. So if I have some, uh, say gigabit or 10 gig optics that is capable of going 100 kilometers, in theory, that's close enough so it hits a repeater and can be seen again. Now, what you're seeing now is the sled is actually jumping. It's getting up to the ship so you can do things like splicing pieces in or you can get up over pipelines or other cables. <clears throat> uh, one of the things that a lot of people are doing now, oh, this is actually a really good shot of it, is they're using remote operated vehicles to inspect, repair, and uh, bring up submarine cables. So a lot of people have asked me, yeah, if it gets broken, how does it, how does it fix it? Well, one of the things that happens is that the um, ROVs have the capability of bringing it up to the ship. They have the capability of, of doing some small repairs. But most importantly, they have the ability to help you find the cable in the first place because that's, you know, it's buried in, in a shallow trench and you need a way to find it. So the systems actually from shore can turn on pingers in the repeaters so that it's easy to get into the right area. And then the ROV actually looks for it using magnetometers. Uh, so it's actually a very interesting thing, uh, very complicated. Uh, I'm not sure what the status is, but about um, eight years ago when I attended a lecture uh, here in Honolulu by a uh, cable designer, she mentioned that there are, all, at the time, there are only four cable laying ships in the world that were capable of doing deep ocean cable laying, uh, like the Atlantic or the Pacific. Uh, apparently two are owned by AT&T. One's called the USS Long Lines. The other's the Charles M. Brown, um, Charlie Brown. <laughs> Another one's owned by ND, NDD out of Japan. And the fourth is owned by Alcatel in France. Very, very sexy ships, very rare, very hard to run. Um, lots of um, really interesting technology has been created over the last, say, 100 years when we went from the original telegraph cables um, to the current um, fiber optics. Right. Now, the, the whole reason why we're bringing up this uh, this little bit of actually very, very cool geekitude is the fact that there's a story coming out of the Med that they caught a group of divers that they say were cutting one of these submarine lines. Uh, they, uh, they, they had... A, reported that they were getting disruption in internet cables, and that's typically caused by either an earthquake, you have an undersea earthquake that, that severs the cables, or more likely a ship's anchor was dragging through the mud, caught one of the cables, and snapped it. This is one of the first times that they've actually said they found people who were cutting it. Now, there's, you, you can go back and forth. I, I don't want to get too far into the, uh, uh, the, the details of the story, because there's there's some rumors that no they didn't cut it that these are these people are innocent, but if uh, Jason switches over to my laptop, you can actually see what is a uh, hold on if I can get to it. This is the submarine cable map across the world. This actually shows you all the different places that they think they have submarine cables. I say they think they have submarine cables, cables because, as Chibert mentioned, a lot of these companies are very unwilling to tell people exactly where they have lines laid. For obvious reasons, this stuff is expensive. Uh, so, as you can see, they've got lines that are going across the Atlantic, lines that are going across the Pacific. You can download this and, and find it yourself. But um, each one of these represents a link that uh, can carry terabytes and terabytes of data, uh, a lot of data. And, Chibert, you, you were saying 
the cost of these lines is also a very closely held secret. But you heard an <clears> estimate <throat> of, of the line that goes between, was it Tokyo and Alaska? Actually, it's from Hokkaido, the northern island of Japan, to Alaska. And the cost estimate that I was um, privileged to hear about was $4 billion. That's billion with a B. B. And, and why is that? I mean, a lot of people think when you're dropping lines to the bottom of the ocean that it's, it's either just copper or fiber. But it's actually, the line itself is pretty high tech, isn't it? Yes, it's custom built. Um, there is no such thing as a standard undersea cable. Even the stuff that I'm using for close to shore for undersea observatories is technically custom built. I inherited it from someone, but it's custom built. In fact, the cable laying ships tend to dock in South Carolina at the um, Corning plant, and they will actually manufacture the cable onto the ship. The, the end of the assembly line is in the ship. So when you start talking about custom cable that's armored, they have fish bite um, prevention layers, they've got uh, layers of copper and steel for strength and also for carrying high voltage electricity so you can power the repeaters. Um, it's very, very sexy stuff. It's very hard to do. There are not many people left that know how to design these sy systems. And because they're so rare, there's not a whole lot of opportunity for things like, you know, learning. So, uh, so I'm kind of wondering about it. Yeah, to the Twyte riot, anyone who wants to get into it, this could be a growth industry. Uh, Arbiter in the chat room is also pointing out the uh, www.cablemap.info for those people who actually want to see that map for themselves. You can download an ultra-high resolution version so you can actually see the individual links. Curtis, uh, let, let me throw this over to you. Typically, the infrastructure is something that enterprise executives are not going to get their hands dirty with. They just hear a dollar amount, they approve the projects, and they go. But is there any concern at the enterprise executive level with uh, the, the safety of transit between uh, the branches of, say, an international conglomeration? If you've got business uh, offices in the United States and in Egypt and, and in Japan, you're going to be transversing these links. Is there any thought given to, well, what happens if these links get cut or what happens if their security is compromised? I think there are two cases in which there's a real concern. The first comes about in some of the nations where you have a single link going in. Now, this is going to be especially important when you get to, uh, to some island nations, also some developing nations where you don't have a, a strong, robust landside infrastructure, and you may be using a single transoceanic cable for, uh, for a major portion of your communications infrastructure to international groups. There it's critical. The other is going to be between the major banking centers of North America and Europe. That's because we know that there are some companies that have paid to have private cables laid. Now, these are cables that are laid using techniques that are different from the standard communication cables. Standard communication cables, they will do two things. Number one, they'll route them away from geological disturbances, and they'll also do their best to hug the topology, let them drape down into the canyons, make sure they go uh, over as few peaks as possible to avoid snagging. With these high-speed trading cables, they do none of that. They're looking for the shortest route between two points. Why is that? It's because by essentially pulling all of the slack out of that cable, they can buy a sizable fraction of a second in latency terms. Now, we don't think of that being a great deal, but when you're looking at the very high-speed trading activities that go on internationally, that can translate out into real huge sums of money over the course of a year. Right, right. And I know that there are some of these trading firms that see that as an incredible competitive advantage. Those directors have to be very concerned about the idea of one of their competitors cutting a cable or even worse, a criminal group essentially holding a cable hostage saying, if you don't give us money, we're going to cut this high speed link. That could be a major disruption for some huge financial transactions. I love that story about the uh, trading houses laying their own cable. And as, and as Chebert has mentioned, it's not cheap. I mean, you could be going up into the multiple billions to get a dedicated fiber going from point to point in order to gain that fraction of a second. 
But the fact that they're willing to pay it shows the, the promise. I mean, if, if you're an enterprise and you're dealing with, say, currency trading, that fraction of a second could, could make you trillions of dollars. And someone else in the chat room, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know who it was that scrolled past, but mentioned that uh, the reason why we don't see government-sponsored cuts, you know, the, you don't have the government of Egypt cutting a cable, you don't have the United States cutting a cable uh, every time they get upset with somebody else, is it's kind of like nuclear war. If you start cutting cables, everyone else starts cutting cables, and sooner or later you have a, a disabled network. Uh, Chibert, one last thing that goes back to you because there's been a lot of, uh, of this going on in the chat room, and that is, this is not the first time that cables have been used as in a weapon, right? I mean, we've tapped in the, the United States has tapped undersea cables before. Actually, before we talk about that, I should point out that the other reason why you're not gonna see people holding, governments holding cables hostage is almost no cables are owned by a single government or corporation. They are so expensive that they're all multinational. So personally, I think these should be more like the Switzerland of data communications. Now, getting on to what everybody in the chat room is asking about, <clears throat> are, are those repeaters also being used by the KGB or the NSA? Well, there was a story that unfortunately I did not have direct experience with of a University of Hawaii researcher that worked with the Navy. He was actually not just UH, he was also um, with some other organizations. But they came up with a plan to have a submarine specially designed to sit on top of a KGB, a KGB, a Russian submarine cable and put a special tap on it. Um, if I remember right, the, uh, there, is, there actually is a book about it and it's called Ivy Bells. Um, I'm not sure, I think I put the link to the book into the, the thing, uh, no I didn't. And oh yes I did, there it is, Operation Ivy Bells. <clears throat> There's also a book on it on Amazon, you might wanna look it up. It makes for fascinating Cold War spy reading. Um, so this special, submarine actually had undersea um, skids on it so it could actually straddle the cable, it could actually bring the cable up into a special moon pool where technicians could then sit and uh, very carefully tap into the cables and were listening to what the KGB thought were secure telephone lines. Makes for a fascinating read. Now, I, you know, you've heard kind of a geek out discussion the last 20 minutes or so about submarine fiber and, uh, you know, this is the sort of stuff that enterprise geeks, IT geeks, get together and talk about over a couple of drinks. Now, it happens because this is how we exchange ideas. This is how we talk about new trends in technology. And it's honestly the way that things get inspired, the way that technology moves forward. That's why I am happy that uh, one of our newest sponsors is a purveyor of these types of discussions, these types of events that gather geeks together to talk about everything they want to talk about. And that is Interop. Now, Chebert and Curtis and I all met through Interop. It, it is a gathering of the minds. And let me tell you, it's now in its 28th year. Interop Las Vegas is the largest independent conference and expo for IT professionals. This year, the agenda, the speakers, the size of the exhibition, and the trending enterprise IT topics all point to one unavoidable conclusion. If you're in IT, you can't miss this year's event. Now, here are six important reasons why you need to make plans to be at Interop Las Vegas. First, Interop is vendor neutral. As a big tent IT show, Interop stands alone as the only vendor neutral event where you can easily compare solutions across a variety of approaches and gain important insight as an education and trending topic event. That means that you can go from Cisco to HP by walking across the hall to find the solution that is best for you. Interop also offers a breadth of content. Interop offers deep content in over 125 conference sessions and workshops on topics like IT management, big data, cloud computing, bring your own device, enterprise mobility, advanced and software-defined networking, virtualization, and information security. Interop also gives you hands-on access to 300-plus solution providers. Those same technology categories will be well represented on the expo floor, where those 300 businesses will exhibit all their wares. Catch up with your existing, existing IT suppliers, plus explore innovative new alternatives that take different approaches to old problems. Interop also lets you see interoperability in action. 
One of the highlights of Interop is the Interop Net. It's a real-life network, the one that Chibert and I build, of the newest gear, the latest solution, supporting the latest standards, all interoperating with each other. Toward the Interop Net's network solutions center, led by the engineers who run it, for some fresh ideas for your own network. Also, Interop offers training specifically for Apple in the enterprise. That's right. New this year, Interop has partnered with Future Media Concepts to offer a training curriculum that focuses on OS X and iOS in the enterprise. The Mac and iOS IT conference classes taught by world-class Apple certified instructors will offer training on managing, supporting, and integrating Macs, iPads, and iPhones into business environments. Interop also offers the Information Week CIO Summit. For the first time at Interop, Information Week will produce the Information Week CIO Summit that includes people like Bill Schlow, the CEO, CIO of the San Francisco Giants, Lyndon Tennyson, the CIO and Senior Vice President of Union Pacific, Michael Capone, Surin Gupta, Frederick Holston, all leaders in their industries. Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to be convinced. We want you to visit www.interop.com to register and to use the code WELV for $200 off your conference pass or for a free expo pass. So go to www.interop.com and use the offer code WELV. We thank Interop for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Now let's get back to it. We uh, have a segment here that I'm calling trolls and open source this is a story out of internet news about how red hat defended rackspace they defeated a linux troll now the story was about unilock which is kind of a patent troll suing rackspace over a patent over now get this the rounding of a number now the patent specifically talks about rounding a number before an operation rather than after an operation it sounds like a finite uh, detail, but it's something that they actually got a patent for. It was U.S. Patent 5892267. Now, the U.S. Patent Court has said, no, uh, I'm sorry, but you can't patent math. You can't patent basic math. Unilock also sued Microsoft and won a $388 million verdict, which was overturned back in 1999, and then they settled out of court for an undisclosed amount of money, but it, it sort of encouraged them. Now, the interesting thing was that they really wanted to go after Red Hat because it wasn't Rackspace that was doing this. It was the operating systems that Rackspace was using, specifically Red Hat. Now, Rackspace was defended by Red Hat because Red Hat has an agreement to indemnify their partners, and therefore they stepped in and they said, no, we're going to take the bullet for this. It's our operating system. We're going to defend. My question to you, I'm going to start with you, Chibert. This sort of open patent assurance, this... this uh, this agreement that if you use my software, I will defend you if you get sued. This is something that we're seeing more and more often. Do you think this is the trend for business in the future of open source? I don't know. You know, that's, wow. It's, it's a hell of a can of worms that we're talking about. Um, yes, I believe in open source. Yes, I would love to see um, people like Red Hat defending people that use open source products. Um, but I think maybe, just maybe, our courts and our patent office needs to take a chill pill and get a grip on reality. <laughs> uh, I'm, actually, I'm actually kind of um, remiss. I'm supposed to go and dig deep into the archives of the University of Hawaii um, Graduate Library to go and find the last remaining copies of the final reports for the AlohaNet project which, oh, by the way, I helped type for that project back in the um, late 70s, mid to late 70s. <clears throat> and the problem was that I vaguely remember typing for Dr. Norman Abramson a section talking about using this new technology called CDMA, um, which was the beginnings of Ethernet. In fact, Bob Metcalf took that, put it on a cable, and called it Ethernet. But... Dr. Abramson actually was um, pontificating about possibly using this as a bulk carrier to be able to carry large numbers of telephone calls in a digitized format between LEX, the local area exchanges, which is exactly the verbiage of the patent that I believe Verizon did and tried to slap Vonage with. Uh, I keep hoping to be able to make the time to go and find that and perhaps, maybe perhaps, demonstrate prior art and invalidate the Verizon patent. Now, 
over to Curtis. Curtis, interestingly enough, Unilock brought this case in Texas. Uh, for those people who haven't been keeping up with patent trolls, why do we see a lot of cases coming out of Texas? Well, it, Texas has, rightly or wrongly, become known as not just Texas, a particular part of Texas, has become known as one of those venues where judges and juries are particularly sympathetic to patent holders. And so in the, the wide world of jurisdiction shopping, it has become the, um, the boutique spot for companies looking to win large awards for patent violations. Uh, I think this is a fascinating case. And, you know, in one sense, what Red Hat is doing is taking on the traditional role. Long before this, this latest wave uh, of lawsuits, the companies that were in, involved in the lawsuits were the companies that made things. You know, if company B made a product that company A felt had violated a, pat uh, a, a patent, they would sue company B. It's relatively recent that we're seeing companies say, you know, we'll bring additional pressure on that infringing company by actually suing their customers, suing the people who are using the product. What we don't know, or I haven't seen thing, and I, I always preface this with, I am not a lawyer, but I've heard the, the, the doubt expressed that someone who buys the product can really legally be held responsible for this. So I think there are an awful lot of issues here. And unfortunately, unless Congress steps in and clarifies things, I think we're going to have years of further court cases before things get worked out. Right. What I like about the story in particular is that Red Hat created this, what are they calling it, open source assurance program back in 2004 to defend their customers against SEO. Again, for anyone who wasn't keeping up on, on patent trolling news at the time, Santa Cruz Operations went after Linux, essentially saying they owned the technology behind Linux, even though it was pretty clear that, uh, well, it just wasn't the same anymore. Now, Red Hat, in order to keep their customers from fleeing out of fear of being sued, said, if you stand with us, we'll stand with you. I, I like this because it shows how uh, something that started with a patent troll from the last generation is now protecting against a patent troll of this generation. And I'm hoping that we see more and more of it, which brings us to our second story in this troll segment, and that is Google the anti-troll. Now, who would have thought? Google has announced a program, their Open Patent Non-Assertion Pledge, or OPN, to not use specific patents to attack unless they are attacked first. Essentially, they've created a little wallet, a little uh, container of patents that they're giving to the community. And they're saying, we're not going to sue you. We're not going to keep you from innovating as long as you don't try to sue us, as long as you don't try to uh, sue one of our partners. It's a really bold pledge, especially if they start putting some of the more core patents, core technologies into it. Now, Google does pledge not to attack unless they're attacked first, and they're starting with 10 patents related to their computing model, model for processing large data sets, which means that they, they're trying to encourage people to use big data to do different things. And I, I think the reason why they're doing this is because they really want to encourage people to develop applications for things like Google Glass. My question to you, and I'm going to go back to you, uh, uh, Chibert, is this sort of open patent non-assertion pledge uh, Red Hat's uh, protection pledge, their indemnity pledge. Is this the way to go to get out of the patent hell that is the current copyright system? Are we just going to start seeing big manufacturers banding together, um, Microsoft and Apple and, uh, and Google, coming and saying, look, here's a safe playground. As long as you stay within this playground, we're going to let you innovate all you want. I, I want to see it. I really do. Um, you know, having this type of protection in, for your sandbox uh, just makes so much sense. Oh, my God. Um, you know, if someone's going to start doing a lot of development, they want to be able to trust the platform. They want to be able to trust that they're not going to buy all kinds of pain and, and grief. Uh, it just makes a lot of sense from the marketing standpoint. And from an ethical standpoint, I think more power to them. I want to see it. Um, now that I actually know, I actually did not know about this until uh, I started looking into it for today's show. And 
I like it. I like it a lot. Google, more power to you. Um, I give you a big point, and I'm much, much more likely to uh, do work with Google development kits now that I know about this type of technology and this kind of legal protection. Curtis B. in the chat room brings up an interesting point. Uh, he says that we still need patent reform since not all companies will agree to it. Curtis, I want to throw this over to you, and, and that is, what happens the first time one of these alliances is attacked? Now, Google has said that they're not, they're not going to attack unless they're attacked first. But the problem is that works if they're attacked by a company making a product. So let's say company X is developing a new phone and they attack Google. Well, Google can now use their war chest of patents to say, if you attack us, we can, we can give you mutually assured destruction. But what happens when you have one of these patent troll companies that they don't make anything? All they've done is acquired IP, so there's no real way to attack them back. How, how do you defend against that kind of attack? Well, again, uh, I'll start with I'm not a lawyer, but from what I've heard, the, the way you, you defend against this, if someone attacks you and they, they are a patent troll firm, you bury them with discovery. Um, Google has cash. Uh, in large quantities, and so what they can do essentially is discovery a smaller company to death. And I suspect that somewhere on their legal team and in their marketing department is the, the internal plan that the first time someone attacks them, they're going to try the uh, shock and awe response, something that is so devastating that it convinces other companies not to even try. To be honest, I sort of hope that happens because I agree with Chebert. This is the kind of thing that we need to see more of if we're going to have the sort of cooperative development that marked the real rapid growth stages of the industry. I admit that I'm worried about one thing, and that is we'll see a lot of this open sourcing or open source type activity while the industry, in this case, big data, is in its infancy. And then after we reap the benefits of all that development, all that innovation, the companies are going to start to say, well, now the money is too big. We really need to start roping these things back in. I think that would be unfortunate, but it, whether it happens or not, it still means we have a long time when we can innovate and companies can use this with greater assurance because of moves like Google's. Uh, I, you have one point in particular that I, I really, really liked, and that is at some point you feel as if we need to have it out. We need to have this nuclear war in the courts. We need to have a patent troll go after one of these open protection alliances and, uh, and actually get its legal ass handed to it. Uh, Chebert, I, I want to I leave this with you. As a person who has done development, as a person who has actually written white papers, as a person who's actually been there innovating in the field of communications technology, uh, you know, we, we've already heard your stance on wanting to work with companies that are going to take a, an open patent pledge. What <laughs> scares you the most about the patent troll environment in which we currently find ourselves? What scares you about trying to, say, develop something with the Aloha Net and the technologies that you've put together knowing that any given time someone might be able to pull out an obscure patent that they, they've just applied for and been granted, and at, at the minimum, been able to tie you up in the courts for years and millions of your own dollars. Yeah, and that's really the problem. You know, especially on startups, we're not always going to have enough, you know, money in our pockets to be able to defend ourselves against these trolls. It's a really sad day when innovation gets stifled by the courts because our patent office is being really stupid about how they award patents. Uh, I'm totally and completely in agreement with you and the chat room. The United States is desperately in need of patent reform. Um, the very fact that we have people patenting things that have very clear cut prior art uh, and is common use um, is really, really bad. You know, the fact that I actually heard some rumors that some numbnuts out in the world is trying to patent the CRC, which was clearly created by Dr. Wes Peterson in 1961. Um, I don't like this. I think it's evil. I think it, they should be punished. And I agree with Kurt. I think we need to have a patent troll get stomped smacked. into the ground. I, they need to be smacked really hard um, because this is bad. This is 
um, anti um, everything that I can think of. And I'm actually having trouble talking because I'm actually really upset about people like patent trolls. I like that. I, I like that passion. But let, let's take a break. Uh, we, we're talking a lot about trolls here, but let's talk about something a little bit nicer. Bring us to that happy, happy place. And you know what a happy place is for us? When we get to help our listeners, when we get to hear questions from the Twilight Riot and give them the answers that they need to do their job. And believe it or not, you know what the number one question is that I get from the Twilight Riot? It's how to sync data. It seems trivial. It seems really simple. But making sure that all of your lists, your address lists, your user lists go from one server to the next, from one backup to the next, from one system to the next is actually a non-trivial process. And if you do it wrong, there are serious serious consequences. That's why I'm happy to welcome another advertiser to the Twiat Riot, to our Twiat audience, to our Twiat list of supporters, and that is Directory Wizards. Now, Directory Wizards offers their all-in-one synchronization solution called Unity Sync. Unity Sync by Directory Wizards provides synchronization solutions, offering countless customizable options to conquer the challenges of your specific environment. They offer a truly unified GAL, that's Global Address List, that lets you create a messaging forest, link seamlessly with HR databases, or build a backup forest to aid in disaster recovery. Unity Sync also supports multiple directory types, including Active Directory, Open LDAP, Oracle, Novell, Lotus Notes Domino, GroupWise, multiple SQL and ODBC databases, and text formats. In other words, if you're using it, they support it. Unity Sync can scale from small directories with hundreds of objects to enterprise directories consisting of hundreds of thousands of objects without requiring extensive training or installation and reconfiguration. In fact, your fully functional evaluation copy can likely be up and running today. There are also no per-user costs or limits. Pricing is per installation, per number of directories being uh, utilized, and upgrades and live technical, technical support for one year is included in your purchase and renewable with a yearly maintenance contract. The web-based user interface is intuitive and friendly. There's no scripting or programming required. Now, one great feature that I really like is that there is no additional database required. Unity Sync is entirely self-contained, synchronizing data from one directory to another without the need to create a third. That's actually a very unique feature. You can do full or partial directory synchronization, affecting all available or just a few attributes. Whatever your needs, Unity Sync can be configured to support them. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to try Unity Sync for your enterprise. Visit Directory Wizard, dearwiz.com slash enterprise today for an extended evaluation that you can download, configure, and put into action now. That's dirwiz.com slash enterprise. And we thank Directory Wizard for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Let's get on to the third segment of our show, and that's something that's near and dear to our hearts. I'm so happy that we had uh, UBM Interop as a sponsor because we want to talk about conferences. This comes out of another Twiat Riot question, and that is, how do I get into IT? How do I get into the technology? How do I start learning about the trends and the technologies that are affecting IT today? Now, Curtis and Brian, both of us, have, we've all, all three of us have talked about this at some point in our careers when we were approached by that, that new IT person, that geek with the stars in his eyes who just wants to learn what it is that we do and how we do it. And uh, one of the examples that we've always given them is, is Interop. Chibert, tell me what is Interop? Interop originally was designed specifically so that corporations that you know, would be able to get together and actually see if their equipment will talk to other equipment. Back in the very, very early days of the internet, it wasn't possible to go out and buy a router yet. It was all brand new. So a whole bunch of friends got together in a little um, restaurant, a closed restaurant somewhere in Monterey, and they set up tables in a bar and started plugging things together and it just got really popular. It just kept snowballing until it was a multinational seven, seven city tour around the world showing off the latest and greatest in tech, network technology. Now, one of my favorite sayings is the best engineers in the world aren't the ones that know it all. They're the ones that know who to call. And that's what interop and trade shows are all about. It's 
the human networking. That I think is actually even more valuable than the technology networking that we go there to see. Right. There are a lot of people who start with certs because certs are a relatively easy place to start. And I'm, I don't want to, I'm not going to degrade training, be it online or in person, but there is something to be said about actually sitting next to an engineer who, who is doing already what you want to learn how to do and just watching him or her do their magic. Curtis, I want to ask you the question in a slightly different way, and that is this. In an era of the internet where we have information available at our fingertips, where we can call up every product spec, every possible solution, we can call up forms that explain to me how I can put a solution into play in my enterprise, why would I need something like an interop or an enterprise connect or the conference that you're at? Why do I have to physically show up to a place that's going to be crowded, that's going to be expensive, that's going to be noisy when I could just do it from the comfort of my home in my pajamas? You ask why people should go to, to live events, and the answer is simple. It allows for, number one, looking at someone, talking with them, asking them spontaneous questions in a way that is very difficult unless you already have a relationship with them when it comes to an online forum. And second, it allows for those serendipitous meetings that are all but impossible in most online forums. You know, when you're sitting in a conference room, listening to someone on the platform tell you about their experiences, you can ask questions. And perhaps as important, you can see other people ask questions and then go up to them after the session and ask them how they got to the point where they had that question. It's those chance encounters those human interactions that lead to deeper relationships and more effective communications after the conference that really make the experience of being together in one place so important. You know, that's where the value comes from, and that's what conferences need to help attendees maximize. I love the fact that you brought up these chance encounters because Twyatt is actually a really good example. Twyatt would not be happening right now if it weren't for the fact that all three of us decided that we were going to be involved in Interop. Somehow, some way, we decided that that's where we needed to go in order to meet people who were in the industry. Now, Chibert, I want to throw it back to you because what I've learned from Interop is every time I go to that conference, and this goes for most of the conferences that I attend, I realize actually how little I know. No matter how much training I've done on my own, no matter how much in the world experience, there's always someone who could teach me something or more likely, who can show me that I have a question that I didn't even know I had. Uh, one of the phrases that I've heard you say a lot is that Interop is a chance for you to, to have your annual helping of humble pie. Can you describe oh, yeah. to me describe to me a, a, an instance where you learned something that just kind of blew you away? Well, I think it was when I was working with Carl Arbach. Um, he's one of the at-large board members for ICANN. He also happens to be the inventor of IPTV. Um, I was working with him. And I was just learning about you know how to do multicast video and things like that. And what totally blew me away was when we started implementing some of this multicast routing. He goes and brings up you know we couldn't figure out how something worked. He actually brings up the uh, RFC for it, and we start picking through the RFC. And I notice, wow. The RFC actually has the names of the people that are working on my team. There's nothing quite like, you know, someone saying, no, it's supposed to be this way. And I go, are you really sure? And he goes, yes, that's my name on the RFC. <laughs> and you just kind of sit back on your heels and go, wow. Yeah. I Talking think about learning it from the source. I think for me, it was, uh, it was the year that I was in charge of monitoring for the NOC. Uh, we were at the Mandalay Bay Convention Center, and we used to do this weird uh, multi-part teardown because we tore down the show floor on one day, but the, the network had to continue running because we had classes running into the next day, and we also had to dump off the registration database back to the, the warehouse. Well, so we're in the midst of tearing down, and teardown day on a show floor, when you've just spent 
a week building it up is frantic because you have to get everything out of the way before the forklifts start coming in, before the semi trucks coming in, start coming in, you know, destroying three million dollars worth of equipment. And uh, we were in the NOC, and the NOC's really uh, noisy because it had all these switches and all these servers. And in the midst of all this hubbub, suddenly we hear, and everything in the NOC just shut down. And people look over at me because I'm in charge of monitoring. And I, I realize that during the, the hot stage that we do here in San Francisco, where we actually build everything, we were getting so many error messages on the UPS because of, of the incomplete setup that you get when you're building something up. I had disconnected the klaxon and I forgot to put it back on. And what had happened was during the, the, the mess of move out, one of the conference hall workers had de-energized our power rail. We switched over to battery backup, which lasted us for half an hour. But because the klaxon wasn't on, we never knew that it had switched over to battery backup. Now, and the nice thing about something like that is, it yeah, it was a serving of humble pie, and people laughed at it, and it was it was a horrible, horrible event. But it really made me remember how much I have left to learn about enterprise IT. There, people in the chat room are nailing it. There, there is no amount of book learning. There's no amount of on learn online learning. There's no amount of learning by yourself that can substitute substitute for actually being in the game with other engineers. Uh, Curtis, let me throw back to you because. You probably cover more conferences than Chibert and I combined. I mean, you you jump from conference to conference to conference. What would you say is something that someone just getting into the game needs to do at his or her first 10 conferences? What are the events that they need to go to? Who are the people they need to seek out? What are the things they need to learn? Well, the big thing is to go and be willing to demonstrate your ignorance. Uh, there's nothing that will limit your enjoyment of and benefiting from a conference faster than going in and deciding that you have to impress other people. Uh, you know, to the extent that, that you and Chebert talk about uh, your yearly dose of humble at interop, for someone like me, it's just incredible being around all those people. So go in and be willing to express your ignorance in public. Another thing is to look for the sessions that matter to you. Actually read the conference agenda. Look at who the speakers are. Go to sessions that have titles like birds of a feather. Those are going to be sessions for people who are engaged in similar activities, people who use common technology, people who might be having the same sort of problems that you have. And finally, don't be afraid to approach the speakers after a conference session is over. It's amazing how many meetings, how many follow-up calls, how many relationships you can establish by simply being willing to go up and talk to someone as they're gathering their papers after a conference session. I do that often, and I find it incredibly valuable. It's the sort of thing that I recommend to just about anyone at one of these conferences. Right. Uh, you know, I, I do, I, I know I'm kind of mixing up the editorial and the sales side because Interop is now a, an advertiser, but I can't say enough how much I have benefited from being as part of that show. Just from a personal note, from, from the geek side, uh, Chibert, you can back me up with this. The, the stuff that we've seen over the last decade at Interop, for you, what, two, two and a half decades? Yep. It, it trumps anything I ever learned while doing formal training. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, some a lot of the stuff that I learned from Interop has been applied to various jobs. Heck, the uh, redesign of the network for the remodeled wedge of the Pentagon was some of it was actually based upon what I learned at Interop. Um, some of the stuff was actually applied to our current um, our new class of submarine that was um, put out that's uh, using more commercial off the shelf technology. And it's just something where the number of people involved that have actually directly influenced the internet is just staggering. Um, I think over a single malt, um, maybe a decade and a half ago, we had this conversation and we, we figured out that the InterruptNet team, directly or indirectly, has affected over 50% of the RFC internet standards that were published at the time. And I believe the number is even higher now. 
Yeah, it, it really is. A, it's a classroom environment. I want to take another break, one last break, to talk about, uh, well, the third of our sponsors. You've heard about them. You love them. At least I love them. And that's Rackspace. Now, everyone is talking about cloud computing, but not all clouds are the same. You see, some use proprietary technology, which may make their solution a bit more slick, uh, their UI a bit easier to use, but it has one major drawback, and that is you're stuck. If you're using a proprietary solution, you can't just take your data and leave without some really expensive, time-consuming process. That's why I love having Rackspace and their open cloud solution built on open standards. You know, Rackspace is part of the honor honored halls of Twilight sponsors because they are the open cloud company. They co-founded OpenStack that now runs the world's largest open cloud. Open cloud means that you're not locked into a single provider. You have the freedom to move your apps, your code base, and your websites between multiple OpenStack-based clouds, public or private, on-premise or hosted. Big business or small business, public or private services or data, Rackspace is the perfect solution for our Twiat crowd, for our Twiat Riot, because they get the enterprise. Now, if you're listening to me now, I want you to help me welcome Rackspace to the Twiat Riot. I want to show them that the Twiat Riot gets them like they get us. Send a tweet to Rackspace thanking them for being part of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Tell them that the Twiat Riot is ready for the rack. And here's the offer. Build what you want, where you want, and how you want. All backed by Rackspace's world-renowned fanatical support. Try it today. Download the open cloud at rackspace.com slash open. That's rackspace.com slash open. And we thank Rackspace for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, you've gone and done it. You've used up another hour listening to This Week in Enterprise Tech. I want to thank our panelists, Brian and Curtis, my longtime co-host, for being here, for shooting the tech breeze. Brian, what's going on with you, either with Thin Links or at uh, the Aloha Net at Ankle? What should we know about the Geek in Paradise? Well, the Geek in Paradise is uh, desperately trying to pound out chapters in a cloud security book that Curtis and I are co-authoring and wondering when I'm going to have enough time to go and get all the uh, remote FX servers configured and ready for me to head off to Citrix Synergy and then eventually TechEd as part of my job with um, ThinLinks. Uh, you keep teasing us with ThinLinks and Citrix. When are we going to actually start to play? Well, you know, supposedly my developers keep telling me I'm going to have a publicly re releasable firmware image any day now. Of course, that's been happening for a few weeks now. But I've been playing with one here, and they do work very nice. And uh, I am really looking forward to handing you one, hopefully at Interop. Woohoo! We're going to party. Over to you, Curtis. What's going on with enterprise efficiency? Where do you find yourself on the road? Where, uh, where are we going to find you in the future? Well, as I said, this week I'm here in Orlando at SNW. I start my live blogging and live coverage tomorrow morning, so I'd love to have everybody come over and uh, follow my coverage, make comments, ask questions. You can find out all about that at enterpriseefficiency.com. Uh, after this, uh, early in May, I'm going to be at Interop. Then I'll also be at TechEd. I'm going to be at SAP Sapphire, and I will certainly let the quiet riot know about where i'm going to be remind you that if you're going to be at any of those conferences let me know i'd love to have a face-to-face -face meeting with you fantastic uh, always i want to thank everyone here at the brick house who makes twight possible starting with my super td the man who juggles many many things including a baby at the moment mr jason howell jason uh, do you have a camera on yourself you, you got to say hi no i don't right now but uh, i don't i'm not juggling a baby yet not juggling a baby very, yet. Very, soon, though. Yeah. But you know what? We never talk about the show that you host here on the Twit Network. Well, what is that? <laughs> oh, well, thanks. Uh, all about Android. Talking all about, well, Android. And you've uh, been on the show. I've, I've been on the show. And you know what? We're going to be doing a story soon that's going to show exactly how much penetration Android has into the, in the enterprise. So uh, if you watch Twilight, I think that's a good companion piece. Excellent. I also want to thank our super producer, Karsten, who currently is in Kauai, so he can't say hi, but he's still the super producer. He's still the man who makes everything go. Now, I want to take the room down a bit and 
talk a little bit about you. That's right, you. You listening or watching right now, did you know that we do this show live every week? Uh huh. Here in the Brick House, Mondays at noon, you can jump onto live.twit.tv and see how the sausage is made. That's right. You get to see the pre-show. You get to see the show. You get to see the post-show. You get to see all the little bits and pieces that go into making one of the best dang enterprise shows on this planet. And if you jump in live, you'll also be able to join us on our live chat room at, at irc.twit.tv, where you'll be able to find some of the most brilliant engineers, some of the funniest trolls, and yes, the temporary community that is the wonderness of Twit. Also, I want to thank everyone for, uh, well, jumping by our YouTube page at youtube.com slash twiet. You can find all of our videos for, uh, well, for streaming, and you'll also be able to join a community that soon, I promise you soon, will be hosting a, uh, a Google Hangout. Chibert keeps reminding me that we keep promising and we don't deliver. We're going to try to do it next week when we're here in the Bay Area together. Uh, so stay tuned, stay uh, aware, and stay sharp. Also, you can follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. There you'll be able to suggest topics for future episodes of Twiet as well as discuss what we've done. And in between, you can find out what the digital Jesuit does to keep himself busy. Thanks to CyberDog in the chat room for doing our show notes. And most of all, thanks to you for stopping by. I'm Father Robert Balliser, and remember... If you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet.